I titled this talk, Reclaiming and Reframing DEI. So we will get a little beyond kind of the 101 today. I definitely want to frame up the foundations of what does that acronym even mean? What are we talking about? But we are in a moment where we're seeing a lot of resistance to DEI. So this talk is going to focus a little bit on that. Um, and obviously, this is like my personal perspective, but I think we can continue doing this work regardless of the challenges that we face. Uh, from that legal background, I think there's a lot of stuff that's not going to hold up in these courts. I think the best way to fight it is to keep doing the work, and we'll talk about how you can do that and protect liability at your company. I know that's important in some of your roles, um, but different ways to, to approach that. So we're going to start with the foundations. What is the intent of DEI? There's a lot of different words in this silo industry, I don't know, expertise, I don't know what to call it. But this realm of DEI often includes diversity, equity, inclusion. My company uses JEDI, uh, so we tag justice as a word into that. Um, a lot of companies, especially in vocational rehab type settings, will use accessibility. Uh, that's a really important component here. And then really what we're talking about, other things that have kind of gained ground in the last decade here, engagement, belonging, right? How do we measure employee morale? So it's all of those things. There's all kinds of acronyms. People will put them in different orders to signify what they think is most important. There's all kinds of stuff happening here. But I believe that all of that stuff is really culture work. We are talking about organizational development. We are talking about organizational culture. And we're talking about who's responsible for building that in ways that benefit our employees most. And there's a reason we do this. There's been plenty of business case talks on DEI. I believe we should be beyond that at this stage. Uh, it is important because it is important. Like that is a very crucial aspect of this work is buying into the fact that these systems need to be changed. There's a lot of business case and statistics that prove that to us. Our workforces are not representative, representative yet. Right? We do not see folks, if you look at Fortune 500 CEOs, we're still talking about so many firsts. Here's the first person to do this of this identity. We've got to get beyond that at some point, right? When we still celebrate the first, which we need to right now because they are big milestones, we haven't pushed into a world where we're representative, right? Because potentially your representation of a particular identity is zero. Uh, so there's a lot of statistical reason to do this. And there's a lot of outcomes reasons, right? The business case does talk about when you have more diverse perspectives in a room, you get better outcomes, you get more innovation, you get more creativity, you get more productivity. That belonging, engagement side of it about how people feel in the workplace, they're willing to give you more if they feel comfortable. So there's a lot of stats behind that. Google it, YouTube it, ask me questions at the end if you want to. But we're going to walk in today with the assumption that this stuff is important and that you and your leadership are willing to invest in it. And we'll talk about how to sell that to leadership. Sometimes it takes you being the advocate, and hopefully that's what I'll arm you with a little bit today. Resistance, lots of it in this field. So much of it very recently uh, has been tied to Elon Musk, who's out there in the world doing what he's doing. Uh, but that phrase he had of DEI must, D-I-E, has picked up a lot of ground. We're seeing this hit higher education quite a bit, where affirmative action is coming under attack. And again, doing it through systems, right? We are taking systems that exist like our legal framework and using it to attack this thing. So we're coming out, we're building lawsuits, we're claiming reverse discrimination, doing all of these things to try and take this type of initiative down. And the US has a very long history of this. Anytime we create space, for change and social progress, we see resistance to it. So very, very large things, once we finally got to true abolition of slavery on Juneteenth, we see Jim Crow pop up pretty quickly after. Immigration waves in the early 1900s, we pretty quickly see an Immigration Act pass through Congress that puts national caps and quotas on who can come into the US. Barack Obama gets elected, we see the Tea Party movement, uh, Black Lives Matter picks up, we see MAGA pick up, all of those things. Anytime there has been progress trying to be made, there is resistance that we face. There is a term for this that I know is a little harsh, but it's called white backlash. In the US in particular, 
where white people carry power in these systems, they are often the group that then their people in power within that society will push for this resistance to exist. And it doesn't necessarily mean that every person who thinks like, oh, is affirmative action fair? That person isn't necessarily creating a movement of backlash. But there are people in power who are very much selling a message to folks to make them scared. They're feeding off of their fear to make sure that we start to systemically take these things down. And the key here is that this often happens before actual progress was made. We talked about it. We built frameworks. Maybe we started to get a little bit excited about it. But we took one step forward, and now we're going to take two steps back. So we have not actually moved the needle. The US has a terrible history of racism and uh, so many other isms. And we have not made significant progress in those because we continue to face these cycles of backlash. So it's important to acknowledge that folks in power are the ones who are pushing for these movements. And it is fair to think about why that messaging works. So this works for people because it feeds off of fear. And there are three particular types of fear that are really prevalent in the current resistance that we're seeing to DEI. So there's this zero-sum game concept, right? If somebody else gains something, does that inherently mean that somebody loses something? And if somebody's going to lose something, I'm being told it's me. So of course I'm going to react to that, right? That's the status threat. The merit threat is that somehow I'm being diminished, right? In the higher education world, this is a big thing. What about this kid who worked so hard and has a 4.2 GPA and can't get into Harvard because somebody else who also has a 4.2 GPA but is of a different identity got it, right? Why did my 4.2 matter? There's this feeling of that. And even for the folks who are not at that level, right? Maybe you are not the 4.2 student, but you still want to believe that you have worth and you worked hard and you know you worked hard. So how is someone going to come in and say that this system handed you this versus you personally earning it? This is so American. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. We believe we did this as an individual person and that we are exceptional. Maybe we are. Maybe we're not. <laughs> so that's something to consider when we think about the systems change is people still want to feel like they're worth something. right? There are ways that we can address these fears without feeding into the threat. And then the moral threat, right? This is a big one where you are being tagged as part of a group. Well, aren't I being stereotyped now, right? Or you're telling me that all people who look like me are going to respond the same way and that we're all bad people. And when we're talking about systems, we're talking about systems. We are not talking about people. To be able to separate yourself, there's been a couple of talks today. I think it was a breakout session, but one was talking about emotional regulation. Right? Can I sit with this feeling for myself, understand it for what it is, and make that separation? I am not a bad person. We are all working in flawed systems. So if you want to be a systems change agent, you've got to be OK acknowledging your role in that. And it might be an unintentional role. right? Um, but again, this is where we can come back to that power and privilege wheel. We all carry all of these. right? It can feel very dismissive to say, Things were handed to you easy. The system favored you always. Everybody's got a story. There was probably a moment in life where they were in a system that did not favor them. If that was based on other identities that they have or the circumstance that they were in, we want to be able to, again, meet these threats, try and diminish these fears. So those are the things that we're seeing happen right now. And those are some of the underlying reasons why we might see it be successful. So if we can address those things in these conversations, I think we gain better ground. And in that, I do think we need to reframe this. So talking about DEI, the way that we've talked about it, the way that we've seen really massive companies do it, we'll get to a section where we talk about things that folks have done that were probably not helpful. But I think we do need to start talking about this stuff a little bit differently. So when we get down to what we're actually looking for, a just workplace is one where your identity is not a predictor of success. 
so our outcome is not necessarily, here's this great pie graph that shows representation. We're going to hit this representation exactly inside our 20-person small company. Right? We're not pushing toward an outcome that is already dictated to us. We're kind of doing the opposite. We're pushing for an outcome where your identity is no longer a predictor of your outcome. And that slide, a few slides back, uh, showed all those stats where right now it feels like it is a predictor. There are so many reasons why somebody could believe they would not get that promotion, they would not get hired, because there's so much data to show that that's happening. So we're trying to get to a world where your identity would not inherently set up your outcomes for the rest of your life. That's the world we're striving for. And that, hopefully, feels like it benefits everybody. Those fears that you might have of being replaced, of not earning what you have, shouldn't exist anymore. Because on all sides, your identity shouldn't be the predictor. So that's what we're working toward, I believe. And that really reframes this into a justice and equity-oriented conversation. So the rest of this talk, we're going to dive into what that looks like, uh, moving out of diversity, equity, and inclusion into organizational justice, which does similar things, but sets it up a little bit differently. Uh, so this is actually a legal framework. Um, and there's three main components here. Procedural justice, which is the actual fairness of a process or policy. Distributive justice, which is the fairness of the outcome. And interactional justice, which is being treated with equity and respect. And these slides will be emailed out to you. So the way that I like to think about that within organizations, I always start with equity. I do think this is equity forward work. I think when we're striving for justice, we have to think of this in terms of creating equitable policies, procedures, and structures. So this really plays into how do we see ourselves in these systems. For me, building an equitable workplace really falls on the people in power, right? You can't take the person who just joined your company two months ago as a staff member and make them make it a more equitable workplace, right? Their presence there did not change the dynamic of your workplace. This is the responsibility of managers, of HR folks, of executive leaders. The folks who already have the power need to be the ones who are setting up new systems, new processes, new policies that will break what is currently in place. This is systems breaking work, which is fun and exciting and creative and scares people. Interactional justice for me is really linking back to that inclusion. So this is where folks feel welcome. And this I do think is the responsibility of everybody. right? I know we've done a lot of DEI trainings in the past few years. This is where that stuff matters. You should be out there learning about perspectives that are different than your own because you are responsible for how somebody feels at your job. Whether it's your coworkers or somebody who's walking in the door to access your services, that one-on-one -on -one personal interaction you are responsible for, regardless of the system you're playing in. Maybe you have leadership that are not willing to change. We talked about this in, uh, I think, that same last session. Um, but there are some federal regulations that guide our work. There are some compliance matters that guide our work. Right? Sometimes we are asking somebody a question using words that are not inclusive. But you are the person asking that question. Feel free to acknowledge it. Nobody from the federal government is watching you. You can say, I hate how they wrote this. Let me use a better word for you. Let me make you feel more comfortable. Let me put you in the driver's seat. You can self-identify. So this, I think, is everybody. And then that leads us to diversity really being the outcome. So I do not believe that we should go set quotas and say, we got to make our workplace 50% this. A, those demographics are going to keep changing. At some point, it will not be 50. It will be more than 50. right? Minorities will not be statistical minorities anymore. And what categories are you going to prioritize? Are you prioritizing racial representation, gender representation, neurodiversity, disabilities and ability status, immigration? right? There are so many categories to hit. If we start by saying, this is the diversity plan, you are already setting yourself up to fail. 
if we build a workplace that has equitable policies, if we build a culture that is inclusive, the goal is that, great, now we've become a top tier employer. Folks want to come here, we should attract more talent, and that should be the outcome. You do want to measure this stuff, don't get me wrong, you want to track it, you want to make sure it's working, <laughs> you want to see where the gaps are, um, but we don't start there. So we're going to dive into each of those three. We'll call them equity, inclusion, and diversity, uh, mostly because I forget which one links to procedural and which one links to interactional. Uh, but these are easier words to keep track of. So equity is embedded. Equity is about your process. It's about your systems. It's about your policies. And again, this is the responsibility of folks in charge. Those people in charge, there's other models we could talk about too, where they go out to the community, right? If you are an HR person, go to your employees. You should check in with them as you pass these policies. You should make sure you have ways to check your own power. But you are the person who's ultimately responsible for that. So in order to start these conversations about equity, we have to have some things that are already agreed to. That we want this world. And that's a big question. I've worked in industries where they say they want it, but then suddenly they're forcing everybody to act the same way. They're forcing everybody to do things exactly how they would do it. They're teaching us how to become them, right? We've started under a false pretense. If you are not open to people being different than you, you cannot do this work. That is the baseline. Again, people with power, they need this understanding. So before you try and run any kind of training for your full staff, make sure your executives are on board. If they're gonna be the ones who raise their hands to ask the question that suddenly makes it an unsafe space, you have lost more ground than you have gained, right? You want the people in power to A, be ready to reflect themselves, and B, be ready to support you as you are pushing for these structural changes. And that willingness is here again. Are they willing to actually do it differently? Or do they already have something in mind and we're just, again, acting under false pretenses here? And that they want to create more opportunity. And this is a hard one for leaders to reflect on. This is not a zero-sum game, right? It does not mean someone's being replaced with somebody else. But to shift these systems and to shift these power balances, somebody does have to give up a little bit of power. If you've got an executive board, that makes their own decisions on their own without ever asking for feedback, they have to be willing to rethink that, right? If they really wanna operate more inclusively, they wanna take diverse perspectives into account as they push policies forward, they have to be willing to give up that idea that they are the most important. And this is where you can come back to those threats, right? I'm sure there's a little bit of status and merit threat here. I got here because I worked hard. I got here because my ideas are good. Great, we can celebrate that. But we can also acknowledge other people have great ideas too. Can we get those on the table? Are you willing to take those into account? So this is the big work. <laughs> this is a lot of conversations. Um, but that's really where you need to start if we're gonna talk about systems change. And then you engage in kind of a process that leads us to how we actually get to the new system. So again, engaging leadership is the first thing. Make sure those three conditions are met. Folks are on board. And then define what it is that you're looking for. What is it about the current system that isn't working? Is it that you're not getting enough folks who are walking through the door to access your services? Is it that people come and take your trainings, but when you track your placement data, you're still seeing disproportion in terms of pay equity? Right? What is the actual problem that you are trying to solve? Is it that some folks return and some folks don't? Who are those people? <laughs> Why are they not returning? So go get that feedback, go understand what the issue is, and then you can propose a way to redesign that. So this is a true redesign of the system. Right? It's not just, great, we identify the problem, let's continue to put reports out every year and show folks how we're progressing toward the solution, right? It is we've learned why the problem exists, 
And so we need to break what exists and make it better. So systems work, that is the theme. I come from an HR background, so I do this internally in organizations. And this is the employee life cycle that folks experience when they're an employee at an organization. So I know for folks who are out there helping job seekers get placed, you can't necessarily impact this for them. But you have other systems that you work in. There's other policies that you use. There's other procedures that are prevalent. Um, so you'll be able to relate that back. But we are going to do a little exercise here that thinks about how we could break some of these systems by first identifying what those norms even are. What are the things that we just decided we should be doing? So think about when you've applied for a job. What's an experience somebody had that was negative through a job application process? Feel free to call it out. Overqualified. Yes, that's a huge one. Being told you're overqualified. There is no best practice. There is no legal statute that says you cannot hire an overqualified person. Maybe that person's going through a life change. Maybe they really need better work-life balance. Maybe they just decided they want to slow down, right? Automatically kicking someone out for that can be really dangerous. And we're running into, I see you in there. Um, we're running into where technology comes into play of this. There are AI systems now that will screen your resumes for you. If you're at a company that is large enough to do that, please take a look at how that technology is working. If you said two years in your job description and someone has six years, it might be kicking them out. And that might not be what you want. Uh, yeah. Oh, I just, I always love the ubiquitous kit, which is, opens up a whole other conversation. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So asking folks to have a PDF resume that they submit, don't do it. Let them enter the information how they want to. If they have one, that's great. Let your system parse it. But there's no need for that. There's no need for a cover letter. People are not writing their own cover letters. They're going to chat GPT. They're forgetting to replace the title of the company. <laughs> this is not helpful to you. And then we talked about uh, resume route. We talked about overqualification. Gaps in resumes is one as well. I think about when I was moving around the country. We didn't have a car in Boston, so I didn't drive for a year. I'd been driving for eight years before then. We got to Nashville where you needed a car, and I got behind the wheel of a car and I drove it. Me taking a year off did not change my ability to drive, right? Maybe I needed a little bit of extra help. I wasn't gonna go hop on an 80 mile per hour highway immediately. I was a little bit nervous about that. But if your company can help someone retransition back into work, great. If they had that skill set at some point, they probably still have that skill set. There's nothing that says pausing to take care of a family member, to have children, to go through life changes. There's nothing that says that that makes you less qualified than if you just kept running. So we're gonna do a breakout again. Uh, let's see what time we're at. Yeah, I'm gonna give you a few minutes at your tables. If you wanna talk about anything across the employee life cycle or in the work that you do, just a system that is at play that is not working. What is something that is actually just a social norm we've fallen into, we do it because we've always done it, versus it is something that actually truly has to be done that way. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes, talk at your tables, see what you can come up with here. Um, but I'm gonna let you all talk for a minute. Uh, we can just take a couple of tables. Anybody come up with any good ideas about something that you realize is just happening because it's always happened that way? It doesn't have to be that way, it's not a compliance thing. It's not a fiscal thing. Anybody have any good examples they came up with at their tables? Yeah, absolutely. Our onboarding Yeah, onboarding. This is how we've done it forever, and you just can keep doing it. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so onboarding. You've always done it one way. You're going to keep doing it that way. Yeah, absolutely. And onboarding is such a whirlwind. Do I need to spend two weeks learning everything about your company and your mission and your vision right now? <laughs> yeah, hit me up in six months. Let me do my job so I understand the words that you're saying. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, one interview processes and how clinical they are. Yes, absolutely. Uh, any ideas that came out about how to break that? Yeah, absolutely. So changing interview processes so they're not so rigid, right? Everybody's asking a question off a of paper. They're giving it a number rating. Can we offer some room for fluidity in that conversation, humanity? And I do think that's, I made fun of that company a little bit ago, uh, but I think that's what people are trying to do with those kinds of icebreaker questions. It's just maybe not landing <laughs> how they hope it does. But yeah, interview processes, and I mean, it's getting nuts out there. I don't know how many folks you're placing in jobs, but I'm seeing six, seven rounds of interviews. The amount of assessments that have increased, where I'm gonna make you do a project before you work for me, pay those people. If you really think that is a need, pay them. Pay them for their time. Uh, and if it's not a need, don't do it. Yeah. Yep. And, and uh, this was a, this week with bankers, and they were all going around saying how they don't hire the people they can't say it correctly, but they said it. <laughs> For those who can't hear, interview processes that value extroversion, right? Something that we do at Work Systems is you answer two questions for your application. I don't care if you have a formatted resume, but talk to me about these two things that you have done in writing because we will email each other. 
right? Have an opportunity for folks to do that kind of thing. Um, the surprise factor of interviews fascinates me. We send our questions in advance. I'm never gonna look at, I'm, maybe, depending on what industry you're in, I guess this could happen sometimes, but in the world I work in, I'm never gonna look at you and say, you have 20 minutes, do this project with no advance notice. You know what your deadlines are gonna be. You can prep, you can research, all of those things. Any other examples? I thought I saw one other hand earlier. Yeah. With regards to recruitment, you know, we talk about um, panel interviews. We are structured to weed people out, like right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a team of people and talking and answering this question, that question, you know, it's it's a format which has been a norm to just weed people out from the beginning. Yeah, panel interviews and interview processes in general being a weeding out tool versus a show me your strengths tool, right? And we see that a lot. I worked at a company, I'll leave it unnamed, uh, but they were so proud of themselves. They were remote before COVID. They were in an environment where they could take folks and had the opportunity to build talent internally, right? So they didn't need you to come in with XYZ certification or degree. And they were so proud of the fact that getting into this particular role at this company was harder than getting into Harvard. In terms of statistics, the number of people who applied and the number of people who actually earned that position was so elite, they were so proud of that. And I was like, this is <laughs> not the way that we wanna welcome folks, right? Lean into people's strengths. Yeah, if you're doing something intentionally to kick someone out of the process, what did any of you gain there? So yeah, like I said, there's lots in recruitment, there's lots across the employee life cycle. You may have examples of this at your company in terms of how folks get promoted or who gets promoted. Compensation philosophy, we can dive into a lot of stuff there about the formulas that people use and what that rewards and what it discourages. Um, and then again, this is obviously an HR driven model, but the work that you all do with clients who walk into your centers, uh, with students who are looking for different pathways, uh, think about those things, right? What are things that we are telling these folks they have to do, because we've always done it that way, versus there's an actual reason. Yeah. I love that you're having us think about it this way, and I've had a recent career change, so I have, you know, that kind of to reflect on. I appreciated and actually kind of look forward to my yearly evaluation. I wanted and craved something specific and measurable to know about my performance. When I think of reimagining that, I'm wondering what it would look like if I had the opportunity to give specific and measurable feedback either about my direct supervisor or the organization itself and how that feedback would really contribute to growth as opposed to a kind of a sit for tat. I think that would be pretty awesome. Yeah, so talking about performance evaluations and that opportunity to get feedback for yourself is important. <laughs> is an opportunity to give feedback to the company, to your direct manager. And I would, performance reviews are a whole thing. I would think about how your company's executing this. If you are the HR person, I know a lot of companies will set KPIs, OKRs, use these crazy acronyms. Some companies will make you set your own goals. Uh, I've been a manager in that situation and I've had someone rewrite their goal to be easier because they wanted to meet it. Like that is the opposite of what we are looking for, right? I like to do three questions. What did you contribute to us strategically? What did you learn this year? And what do you want to improve on next year? Take that opportunity to chat. Keep your feedback real time so you don't have to wait for an evaluation cycle. All of those kinds of things. So again, this is a little HR specific, uh, but hopefully this idea of systems change, breaking social norms, hopefully that's applicable for you in other realms as well. So that was the whole equity section, right? Systems change, folks in power leading that. Now we're gonna talk about inclusion, which does involve everybody at your workplace. And again, Lots of words here. People are now measuring belonging and engagement in a particular way. There's a great platform called CultureAmp. Uh, if you are looking to measure this for internal employees or folks who access your services, I think it's a great platform. They've got organizational design PhDs on their staff who write these questions for you. They've got ways to cut the data by different types of demographic groups so you can understand, cool, 60% of our workforce is engaged. Who are those 60%? Being able to break that down can be really helpful. Um, so yeah, these words can be belonging, inclusion, engagement, um, but these are kind of the categories that we're talking about. So the worst version of this is exclusion. I don't feel like I belong. I don't feel welcome here. 
And then there's kind of two ways that we can split off where we're almost meeting the mark, but we're not quite there yet. So that is differentiation. I am different, people know I'm different, but that makes me uncomfortable, right? Or I am different and I don't have the same opportunities because I'm vocal about the fact that I'm different. I don't get to speak in meetings because people know I'm gonna bring a different perspective, whatever those things are. On the opposite end is assimilation. And this is interesting, again, as a daughter of immigrants, I was very much raised to assimilate. That's how my parents survived, and that's what they thought would set me up for success. And I get it, I get where they're coming from. I am different, I know I'm different, but I don't need you to know I'm different. I'm gonna speak how you speak, I'm gonna dress how you dress, right? This is where like professionalism can come into play a lot. We ask people to assimilate. Be professional, dress for work a certain way, dress for your interview a certain way, speak at a certain cadence, all of these things. Be extroverted when you're introverted. Right? If we're forcing people to not be different when they truly are, we didn't gain anything. <laughs> right? We have not moved the needle in terms of innovation, creativity, perspectives, because we force them to be the same as everybody else. So true inclusion, true belonging. That is, I am different, I know it, you know it, and we're all okay with it. Right? This is not we tolerate difference. This is we respect it, we honor it, we validate it. And we acknowledge that that adds something to our culture, right? It is important that you are different. We want you to be that way. So that's what we're aiming for. So many models. Another one that comes into play here is psychological safety. So you will hear some DEI folks talk about psychological safety. There's a great book by Amy Edmondson that talks about this. But this is the outcome. This is what you gain. So as you are doing, if you're bringing trainings into your organization, if you're trying to convince, convince folks to do something differently, have that one-on-one -on -one conversation differently, if you're trying to convince people to act more inclusively, this is what you can sell them on in terms of what they will get. So we heard about some neuroscience earlier this morning. Um, we saw that growth model where you go from your comfort zone all the way over to that growth zone, and that requires safety. That slide mentioned safety quite a few times because people need to know they will be okay when they express themselves differently, when they experiment, when they try something new, when they bring a different perspective to the table. And again, this is where leadership being on board matters a lot. Some of these categories you're seeing in learner safety and challenger safety, right? Can people say they disagree with what the executive director just said? If they can't, why are we even having the conversation? The executive director could have sent an email, a memo, it's set in stone, we're done, right? You need people to feel like they can voice something genuinely here and build it into your process to take that feedback and adapt if you need to. Sometimes you're gonna say no, that's okay. But do people feel like if they say something, they will be heard? And this matters for how your coworkers interact with each other. If you are not in a management role, if you're just working with coworkers, or again, if you're working with those people who are walking into your centers, can they be honest with you? Will you respond to them in a positive way? Will you shame them if they say something, right? So the first one was looking at the types of belonging and inclusion that exist. This is really what we gain when inclusion is there. Inclusion is a big topic. How do you build inclusive cultures? How do you encourage people to be more respectful? How do you get folks kind of out of their positionality into somebody else's? Totally separate talks. Uh, but feel free to ask questions on that if you've got them. And check the time. All right. Yeah, we're doing good. So then our last bucket becomes diversity as the outcome. And again, my message here is if you build equitable systems and policies, if you teach folks and encourage the culture to be inclusive, you will gain more diverse perspectives. That is the outcome we are hoping for here. And this, again, goes across a lot of different, that is so fuzzy up there. Uh, this goes across a lot of different identity types. 
right? It is good to focus. If you are working in a system that has been systemically unequitable from a racial justice lens, great. You should prioritize that, right? If you are really trying to take down norms and systems that have oppressed folks on gender lines for a long time, great. You should focus on things that need that focus, but you should also, as you rebuild systems with that lens, ensure that it's capturing everything. Because again, we're gonna see the needle continue to move, right? We, this work is not ever gonna be done. My job security is hopefully pretty high. <laughs> There's a lot of people who need a lot of access that they do not have right now across a wide range of things. Again, some of those industries that I've been in, when there's money flowing, people hop on a plane, go to Florida, everybody drinks. What are we doing for our folks in recovery? What are we doing for our folks who are sober? Right? Is, are they excluded from that? Maybe we say like, well, it's optional, you don't have to attend, but now this person got to talk to the CEO and this person didn't. Right? So there's so many different identities that we can dive into here. Introversion and extroversion comes up a lot. How are you operating in a way that allows folks who process differently to have time to process, to have time to think, to have time to respond? So all kinds of things here. And this is an interesting one. It is interesting to encourage employees to act more inclusively because it is hard to say, usually in these, there's a spectrum or there's a binary, right? So you might have someone who says, well, I prefer email. If we're in an inclusive culture, you should email me. And then they've got the colleague who's like, well, I prefer a Zoom call, so if we're inclusive, you should Zoom call me. <laughs> like, what are we gonna do here? Truthfully, I have experienced this. I record myself and then send it in an email. I'm a verbal person. I'm not gonna write you a 70 paragraph email. I don't want to, I really don't. So I just record myself talking and then I'll send it to the person who needs time to process so that they have time without that being a live interaction where they can then write an email back. So we've kind of solved it in that way. My message is that equity and inclusion will lead to diversity. So I'm not handing you a roadmap to diversity, but I'm gonna tell you what you shouldn't do. <laughs> Performative efforts, we can find some humor in this, but it is also so, so tragic. Burger King did something last Pride season. You could buy a sandwich with two tops or two bottoms. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and every Pride, Every pride you see people changing their logos. There is nothing wrong with visibility. There is nothing wrong with calling visibility to an issue, to a cause. But you better be ready if you're gonna put that commercial out there. Do you offer healthcare that is inclusive of domestic partnership? Do you offer parental leave that is non-gendered? If you're gonna do this, you better be doing the other stuff. <laughs> this is an insane approach. This happened a while ago. Ellen DeGeneres had a big thing about it, but the Bic for her pens. Here's a pen, but it's pink. Okay. <laughs> Again, do you have pay parity? Are your women paid the same as your men? Are they promoting at the same rates? Don't hand me a pink pen and tell me you care about diversity. This is not enough. And this whole thing that happened last year. <laughs> Oh, the last one was Nancy Pelosi and people in Congress just like put on these kinta cloths and like kneeled for a minute. I think this was around Juneteenth. I would, I don't know what else they would have linked it to, but it was not, there was no message. It was not effective. We did not move forward as a nation. It was very odd. <laughs> There's also a really big concept here of tokenization or using people to make yourself feel better. Right, we, again, going back to those fears and threats, there's that moral threat. Am I a bad person? Do not use somebody else to make you feel like a better person. That is not their job. I wish I could play this clip. I couldn't find it on YouTube, uh, but this is from the movie American Fiction, which came out recently. Great movie if you haven't seen it. And there's a great scene. This main character is an author, has been an author for a number of years, decades and gets a call from someone who runs these literary prizes. So he gives out literary awards. So this white man is on the phone with this black man, and he's saying, like many American institutions, 
mine was recently rattled by the notion that our lack of diversity has led to a blind spot in our work. So, you know, we're trying to remedy that. So he's offering this person a judgeship for this award. And this author says, let me first say I'm honored you choose me out of all the black writers that you could go to out of fear of being called racist. <laughs> Do not put people in that situation. If your company just came under fire because somebody flagged something that was an issue for you, do not make the solution immediately finding somebody to bring into the organization so you can say, look at me, I'm not this ism because I have this friend. Like That is not going to work and will likely make it worse. If you do not have those equitable systems in place, if your people are not ready to accept and respect and validate that person, you'll likely see some turnover and then you'll get more bad press. Like this does not solve it. It is not the way to go about this. So there's a lot of things that come into, again, measuring these things, showing folks you're making progress, analyzing truly good and equitable data to see where the gaps are and where you can continue to make systems changes to see improvement. But I very much caution against starting from a place of, I need this many people of these identities. Let's get them into the workforce and increase our representation, right? Don't just take photos and throw them on your website. In college, I'm like, I know a lot of people have this experience, I'm like all over the college website. Oh, great, <laughs> like that didn't need to happen. It doesn't help to do it that way. Just make it a better experience for folks and that will gain far, far more ground than any kind of PR campaign you can run here. Oh, I'm doing great on time. So the main message here, think about equitable systems, think about systems change when we're doing this work. We are under fire right now. So that resistance is there. It will pick up. We'll see what happens this election season. We may see another executive order that comes out and says you're not allowed to do DEI work. I encourage you to think about this in terms of how you can still do DEI work. It is important to use those words. It is important that we call these things out and name them. But it is also important to continue the work despite that resistance, right? If something comes out for higher ed that says stop DEI efforts, and you're in workforce development or nonprofits, fight your leaders on this a little bit. They don't have to obey that order. They're not in that sector. This doesn't impact them. Take the risk. Be the company that continues to push this stuff forward so that we can prove Whatever lawsuit is in play right now has no basis, right? Do systems change work. If suddenly you cannot call it, here is our equity plan. Call it literally anything else. Update your HR policies, update your handbooks, make these changes regardless of what people try and tell you you can't do. None of this stuff, when we're thinking back to that exercise, is dictated by law. If there is not a reason that liability for your company increases, that cost for your company increases, there's no reason not to do it, right? We think that some of this stuff is being forced on us, and it really is not. This is my little mirror side. The future of work is you. Surprise. <laughs> you all can lead this. Um, so yeah, and, and feel free to strategize with folks about that. Um, I'm a millennial, so I didn't bring business cards, but here's my email. Uh, <laughs> you can find me on LinkedIn. Feel free to shoot me questions. And we've got about 10 minutes before this session ends, so I'm happy to take any other questions from the audience now. Yeah. Yeah. So you did, you answered some of them. Is and here, I'll have you. Oh, Sorry. Yes, I have the mic. <laughs> um, I'm curious about suggested or successful strategies in delivering DEI trainings, and if it should come from someone from the same population or outside of that population. Yeah, this is an interesting one. We've talked about this a lot in my workplace. Uh, when you're doing DEI trainings, and again, I don't recommend ever calling it that, um, but when you bring folks in to do an educational session where you're learning more about somebody's lived experience, do you do that with somebody who has that lived experience or do you do it with somebody who doesn't? And there's different opinions here, right? We don't want to tokenize. We don't want to make people explain themselves when other people could put in effort to do that themselves, right? There was a lot of stuff 
as big headlines hit, you'll see people text their friends and say like, oh my gosh, I never knew you experienced this thing. Can you tell me about it? And it's like the last, person, the last thing that person needs right now, right? So I would lean on your presenters. I would lean on the way that you go RFP or figure out who that vendor is gonna be. Frame it up with the outcomes. We want folks to learn X, Y, and Z and let people apply if they're interested in giving that talk, if they come from that experience. I always think that's really powerful. Uh, but that way you're not just like handpicking someone and being like, I know you're of this identity. Come talk to us about how that's been for you. Um, so I think it's really dependent on the person. Uh, yeah, and a lot of, I think, inclusion is choice. There are some trainings out there that are also about language. How do we speak about people? How do we even ask these questions, right? For folks with disabilities, are we people first or are we disability first? And that's different for each person. So the best way to do this work, I think, is just asking questions. So I would frame up that proposal that shares what you're looking for. If somebody's comfortable giving that talk, great. Give them the opportunity. I think that's fantastic. Um, but yeah, handpicking somebody and saying, like, you should do this, probably not the right way to go. Yeah. yeah. Ask me, I'll need the mic. Yeah. <laughs> you did not ask me, but I'm going to give you a response. I think that it should come from that population. It's almost like going to a women's conference and all the speakers are men. What are they going to tell us about stuff that happens with us? Our breasts, you know, all of those. So what are they going to share with us? Because they don't have the experience. They don't have, uh, they're not embodied embodied in a woman. Right. So I, I do believe that's just my personal belief. But it should come from the population. And this is where, again, the system of it matters. If you're going to do a DEI training and it's only going to happen during Women's History Month, you kind of set yourself up to have some of those awkward conversations versus we are a company who is committed to ongoing learning. Right? We're not building a list of every identity possible and hitting it in a particular order so that we can pat ourselves on the back. This work will never end. We will continue to cycle in a variety of speakers who can touch on these things. And then it doesn't have to feel like this is the one person saying the one thing, right? Because that's also, true. we're not monoliths. Whoever you bring in may not capture everybody's experience. So that's where, yeah, I think definitely for identity specific talks, uh, that might be helpful. But also letting your employees know this isn't the end all be all. And we don't imagine that it would be. Any other questions? I want to hear your other questions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let a different question come and then I'll come okay. back to you. No, that's great. Um, I was wondering if you could, uh, or if I guess for the room, if we could speak to kind of the balance. Uh, I was in a conversation recently where we were discussing uh, bringing on board a DEI committee and someone, uh, someone threw out kind of this idea that DEI should be embedded in every committee and every facet of the workforce, but it almost came off as like an excuse to not put focus on this. Um, and while I, while I do agree with the, the sentiment that it should be an aspect of all of the work that we do, I'm wondering how we can kind of bridge that balance. Yeah, and again, I'd come back to the idea that if that equity work is going to matter and have lasting change, your leadership has to be on board. If your leadership is creating a DEI committee of employees to go execute this work for them, no. Like, that is definitely not the route that you want to go. Those employees can't make those changes. I really like advisory groups where we've got employee representation, and the way that we embed this across things is that when a department is going to take an action, they can run it through this council. And your executive leaders sit there as sponsors and say, OK, great, we will now go support this change. So I do think there's a balance there in terms of we don't want to put that work. And again, like who's in that room can be very interesting, too. Oftentimes, we tag this work to folks who have some kind of lived experience. And now we're weighing them down. They're doing it in addition to their job. Let them choose to be in the room, right? Compensate folks for that extra time if you can. Um, but yeah, that would be my recommendation, is the responsibility needs to be really clear. That is still the responsibility of people in power to actually execute those changes. But get an advisory group in place that can help educate, that can help vet, that can offer feedback, all those things. Any other thoughts in the room to respond to that? All right, and then did we have a second question here? I always have a second question. <laughs> 
<laughs> I did the, the training thing. I just I feel with close proximity to many folks who come from white male you know backgrounds, I feel like sometimes there's more power that would come in their shift in thinking if if they heard from somebody else who is like them, somebody who has you know felt this. Now, you did your phrasing well. I'm not trying to this part. I have this conversation very regularly to the point that it's exhausting, right? But that focus of, yes, you're feeling marginalized right now and you feel like you are a bad person or you represent something bad, but there's there's more to what's happening right here. And I think that the honesty of that conversation coming from someone who looks like them may carry more weight and push them further than a nagging wife, hypothetically. Um, so I just, I just wonder about all these different ways that we can have these conversations, not that one would be better than the other, but what that can look like in advancing this conversation, acknowledging that some of these topics are uncomfortable, and that's okay to be uncomfortable. Let's get past that and move forward. And so um, it is, I mean, it's just something that I think that there's lots of ways to do it, maybe not just one, um, but I'm, I'm just curious about examples of that that I can probably explore as well. Yeah, and I think what you're talking about lends to that last slide about centering and decentering identities. Think about your workforce. If you are going to do a company-wide training where you bring in a white male to speak to white males, you've already failed. Cause you ignored other employees. If those white males need to have a conversation with another white male, give them a space for that, <laughs> right? Uh, give everybody a space for that. Give your people of color a space for that. If you want to break people of color into specific races, fantastic. Give your disability folks a space for that, right? People talking to people who are like them is important. We code switch and we cover a lot in the workplace, which is where we try not to be ourselves to fit into the norm, right? We are assimilating in those circumstances. And doing that, I think, taking the pressure off to do that is really good. Like I've certainly sat in company-wide DEI trainings, especially in the Pacific Northwest. We are very white liberal. We fall into that stereotype where people are talking amongst themselves about like, they're asking these types of questions, right? Like we're doing a training on this, who do we bring in? Or I feel so guilty about this, or I feel so bad about this, or like I'm processing right now, and like, I don't have capacity for you right now. <laughs> like, so it is important, I think, and that is the thing, when we think about this work not as check boxes, we're doing training, how do we do training in one specific way? Create a system where training is always talked about, where ongoing learning and space for conversation is always there. All of those things. So all of these answers are gonna be like, do it all. <laughs> um, but if you can build that into the structure, uh, you might not even need to formalize that space a few years down the road. Employees just lean on each other. Uh, we are coming up on time. Is that what you were flagging for me? Do you have a question? Well, I don't know if it's a good question, but since I just came here, I'm testing the report. So, <laughs> so I think, this is in, I think, China, so let, let me know if this helps. Um, I appreciate, and uh, I don't know if this is employees and everything, and I really enjoy um, every time when I walk into an office for clientele, you would have you know, white people who are there to help you, and they, they want to encourage you and, and build and all that good stuff. But sometimes it feels like, like you don't want them to, you don't want them to feel like they're below you, like, oh, they'll, they'll do anything for you. It's like, you want them, like, no, 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 don't give me a handout. Just just give me an opportunity to gain your service or gain your trust and everything. And so how do you tell them that they don't have to do that without telling them they don't have to do that? Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Again, we want to be careful of power dynamics, right? If you're talking to your boss, regardless of that person's identity, if they tell you to do something, it's going to feel like they're telling you to do something, they're your boss, right? So acknowledging those dynamics in the room, maybe setting up a mentorship program where it very intentionally is not your boss. It's just someone where you can come and say, I have this professional question. Can you give me some advice? Can you coach me through this? I think there's those kinds of approaches to it. Because yeah, I, there's so many dynamics there where race could play in or position could play in where they might be trying to be nice, but regardless of that intent, the impact is my boss now told me a thing. I feel like I have to do it the way they told me to do it. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. And the other thing there too, I think, is identity is interesting. All of us, again, I think seeing yourself as an individual and a part of a system simultaneously is the work, and it is very hard, it is very nuanced. But I've certainly had women-identified managers who are so cynical about what they've experienced. Their advice to me is playing to the system more than 
a male manager I might have who says, be who you are, <laughs> right? So leaning it just on that, I think, is not quite enough. Um, it really is about trying to think of the entirety of who we are, the entirety of the system we're interacting with, uh, and that's why it's difficult. We are at time. I will hang out if you have other questions or if you want to connect. Uh, again, find me on LinkedIn, shoot me an email. Happy to continue these conversations. But thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thank you.